What's up, everybody? So glad you are with us. My name is Joey. I'm the lead pastor right here. I want to welcome you again. Also want to say hello to all of our physical locations and those watching online. Let's welcome them, everybody. You made a good decision to hear God's word today. I believe that. And before we get into it, uh, we have an event coming up uh, called Sit With Me Sunday, or if you're online, Watch With Me Sunday. And we do these every so often just to further encourage you to invite people to church. Those days are really centered around evangelism, centered around uh, inviting people to experience the gospel. We'll tell some great stories. So I want you to now, even now, be praying and thinking, who do I need? to bring to church? Who do I need to share this with? Going to be a great day. There are actually invites on your seat at physical locations. Use those. Don't waste them. All right. All right. It's going to be a great, great, great day. All right. So we're in a series called One Up, One Down. Uh, This is week five. And then the final week next week as we celebrate baptisms. Come on, somebody. (laughs) And uh, the whole concept of this series has been that there's somebody ahead of you, further along in your journey with God, career, whatever it is, one up. And then there's also people who aren't necessarily where you're at, one down, not derogatory, just you're pulling them up towards you. And all of us have this purpose. All of us have this responsibility to reach up and out and reach back and pull. And that, that's our responsibility. It's, it's about discipleship. It's about being a disciple, making disciples. And I, I, have you gotten something from this series? I don't want to just preach this stuff. I want you to apply this stuff. And hopefully today, uh, while this is going to be a heavy message with a lot of, a lot of meat in here, uh, I, I want you to walk away from this and take it and, and do something with it. That's my hope. That's, that's my goal as a preacher. And I don't know about you, uh, but uh, did anybody ever have some crazy name lists for your kids who are in the womb? Before they came, you just were writing anything down. Sometimes I was just writing crazy stuff down just to get a reaction, you know. And uh, I had a few different names. This isn't a crazy name, but one of the names I liked for Maverick was Winston. Oh, okay. Tough crowd. And uh, Winston, I liked Winston for two reasons. Uh, Number one, I I really like history and Winston Churchill. He was just such a tough guy, went in World War II, you know. And then I also uh, had this, uh, I kept seeing DJ Khaled, uh, I kept hearing it in my head that all I do is win. And I kept saying, Lauren, uh, if we name our son Winston, his nickname will be Win. And, And everybody needs a win in their life. You like that? And, uh, but she said no. And so I did something even more drastic and named him Maverick. And uh, anyway, but the thing is, is I like to win. Anybody like to win? And I like to see other people win. I like to see other people win. And I really believe this, that you're winning in life. And I don't just mean gaining and getting, but you're winning in life truly is connected to the gospel. And, and one of the ways you can evaluate if you're a winner is, is if you are seeing others win. Or better yet, if you are winning others to Christ. Every believer, listen to me, every believer has a responsibility to play a part in winning others to Christ Jesus, to make converts, to make disciples, to lead people to Jesus Christ. Because if we say we love people, then we will share the good news with them. We, we can't make anybody do anything, but we can live a life worthy of this calling to make our lives so attractive that they say, I've got to have what they have. So title of my message today is Make a Disciple, Evangelize. Make a Disciple, Evangelize. Write that in the chat. Make a Disciple, Evangelize. That's what we're going to get into today. And I have a lot of scripture, a lot. But before I I kind of give you, I guess, practical takeaways, I want to talk a little bit about myself. I want to clarify my role and your role. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Paul writes, Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. 
Their responsibility, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work, build up the church, the body of Christ. So the, the, these offices in the church, if you will, these, these ministry mandates, these, these callings, not everybody is called to do these things. Not everyone is called to be an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Uh, although we can shepherd, evangelize, pastor in our own spheres. But, but when he's talking about the offices in the church of Jesus Christ, these individuals, their job is to equip the saints, every believer, you are a saint if you're in Christ Jesus, okay? The, the Catholic Church may not have given you sainthood, but the scriptures do, okay? And, and so, so I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm extremely pastoral. I mean, I definitely have a, a, a pastor's heart, but like it, it, some people can sit with people for two hours and just nod their head and listen to them cry. I will start crying, at that point, if I'm sitting that long. Uh, so I, I function more like prophetically and, and apostolically. In other words, I find most joy and gladness uh, and fulfillment in my purpose of starting churches, equipping churches, starting new works, uh, helping other ministries succeed. I, I love helping other pastors minister at a higher level. I love to give to other pastors. I, I don't call myself an apostle, but I, I like to function in that role. Uh, it's kind of similar to Paul's ministry in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, where he says, besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. I feel that. I, I, that, that that's who I am. Okay, so I know myself. I know my purpose is to, to raise up leaders, to, to lead our staff. But most importantly, through my teaching and through the systems and structures of our church, it's to equip you for the work of the church. It's not that I'm not going to serve or counsel or shepherd. It's just that that's not really my job. It's to equip you to do those things. Uh, further scriptural precedence we see in Acts chapter 6. Uh, Bible says in verse 1, but as the believers rap apply, rap, rapidly multiplied, I said rap applied, uh, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. He wasn't saying let's eliminate the food program. He's just saying, we've got to focus on what we do. And so brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We give them this responsibility. Okay, so I'm giving you some context setting you up because I'm attempting to build a case for your responsibilities to the kingdom and to the church. Ultimately, ultimately, there's a question you need to answer. You need to answer this. Does my life have evidence of the kingdom of God at work through me? Ask yourself that. Does my life have evidence of the kingdom of God at work through me? Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Bible says this, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. Not preach, not teach, not start churches, not any of those things. These miraculous signs accompany those who believe. Here's what they are. They will cast out demons in my name. They'll speak in new languages. They'll also handle snakes with safety. Somebody bring me out the snake. Just kidding. <laughs> If they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They'll be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. How are you doing with this? Hmm. All right, look, I got the poisonous stuff down because I drink Coke Zero all the time. So aspartame. <laughs> but if you think this is far-fetched, okay? I, I was in Latin America one time and I saw people literally cast out demons in a witch's house. Uh, I, uh, same trip, preacher didn't speak the language, but started preaching in the native language under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Um, I've been in a room where folks were praying in tongues, but actually speaking in different languages that they didn't speak. Plenty of times, uh, folks have laid hands on others and, and they're healed. Our prayer teams have seen cancer and tumors disappear within a week of praying. 
A, a lady in Port Richmond, our Port Richmond location, who had trouble conceiving, received prayer, and they listened, they could trace her conception back to the day after she was prayed for. A lady who wasn't supposed to be well enough to have kids had a perfectly healthy baby boy. Two young girls who were demonized got delivered in Port Richmond and in the Northeast. We are seeing miracles in our church. Now, handling snakes, really that's a reference to them being in the desert. Okay, so an example of this would be that that could play out in a car accident or other things, that, that God's protecting you for as long as you are meant to minister and go. Okay, so, uh, but listen to me. Of all the things that I mentioned, okay, I, I've, I've only witnessed from one of those, all the things I mentioned, I only witnessed one of those from a preacher or a pastor, the guy who was preaching and spoke in a native tongue. I'm trying to expand your mind and help you know that this is not far-fetched for anyone. This is not. And so when the scriptures say that the evidence of those who believe is that essentially you've got faith to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Jesus does the healing, you do the faithing. And, and so, so I'm, I'm, again, I'm building a case because you have a responsibility to evangelize. And one of the best ways that we evangelize is to bring forth God's power. You know, I think... Um, you know, Barna Research, which is very popular and very studied research, says only two in five Christians are engaged in disciple making, which is connected to evangelism. And I, honestly, I think we've reached a point in our culture where philosophy, opinions, and arguments just aren't that effective anymore. I don't know how, how effective your Facebook posts are. We have to be experience makers. We have to experience the Holy Spirit for ourselves, and then give the Holy Spirit away to others. Mediocre, boring, even entertaining Christianity is a thing of the past that lacks the power to reach people who are far from God. We might use the language lost people, lost people representing the prodigal son, those who are lost but need to come home to the house of God, home, come home to God. We must be under the anointing of God's spirit, people of God. You know, furthermore, Gen Z and some millennials, according to data, actually don't even care if Christianity is true. They just want to know if Christianity is good. If it's good for people and if it's good for society, which I believe it's the best thing for our world. When we give people an experience of love and service and an invitation to God's house, to a healthy home, like the block church, what we're doing is we're showing people that Christianity uh, isn't uh, just some philosophy, but it's a lifestyle of people who, who are good for our world. It's just the truth. Christianity historically has been the best thing for society. The foundation of all things in our culture, literature, all of it stem from the truths of the word of God. Sometimes people get it wrong and manipulated and sometimes people uh, do things, declare wars, or sometimes people break up with people or do things saying that it's God when sometimes it isn't. But that doesn't change the fact that the best thing for our world has always been the, the reality and the truth of God's standard, God's plan, and the morality he encourages us all to live under. Truth. Chris Vallotton says this, he's a preacher, I love this. He says, the Holy Spirit is in you for you, but he's in you, he's on you for others. I'll say it again, because I, I messed up my words. The Holy Spirit is in you for you, but he's on you for others. You know, in Acts 13, we're told to be a light and bring Christ to the ends of the earth. In Mark 16, we're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In Matthew 5, we're told to let our light shine. In Matthew 28, we're told to go and make disciples of all nations. In 2 Thessalonians, we're told you are called to this gospel. In 2 Timothy, we're told to preach the word in season and out of season. 
In Acts, we're told the disciples never stopped preaching and teaching the word of God. In 1 Corinthians, we're told to be all things to all men so that by any means we could win some. I guess the question is, is have I had convinced you yet that you are called to do the work of the church and the kingdom? This is why we offer you opportunities to serve. It's one part of it. But evangelizing is the other part of it. Bringing people to church. We have sit with me Sunday coming. That's a great and simple way. And you should do that. You should always be looking to invite and bring people and share the message. But it's not the only way. It can happen in your job. It can happen in your home. It can happen as you have people over for dinner. It, it, on teams. It can happen in your rec league. Don't limit yourself to your purpose of serving. And I want to further compel you to reach those who don't know Christ. Data from the Barna Group says as early as 2020, just one in four Americans qualified as a practicing Christian, meaning they were engaged with scripture, attending church, evangelizing, and having a personal prayer life. So we've got a lot of work to do. I, I heard a stat that 30 some percent of people have stopped coming to church, going to church since the pandemic. And literally no reason as to why they're not going. Some people do have some reasons, but most people don't. 96% of millennials will say that sharing their faith is an important part of their relationship with Jesus. However, listen to this, 47% of those same millennials will say it's not right to share your faith with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will convert. Well, this is wrong and it's senseless, especially if we believe Jesus is the only way. Oh, it's too many of us have too much fear. We, we, we fear disengaging or disagreeing with people, losing relationships. And it's not really about whether you're right or wrong. It's about the truth. I think some of us just fear we don't have all the answers. We don't have to run around Bible thumping people. We've got to run around loving people. But that doesn't mean that we're void of the truth. It just has to be done in a, in a tasteful, tactful way. 62% of non-Christians are looking to have conversation with people of faith who aren't judgmental. They claim that they only know 34% of Christians who aren't judgmental. So I want to just define judgmental for a second. It's nose up on other people's sin or lifestyle. It's I can't be in a relationship with you, friendship, or no, I don't mean romantic relationship. You shouldn't be in romantic relationship with people who don't who do, do not start a romantic relationship with somebody who is not of the same faith. That's a mess. But I can't be in a relationship with you because we're different and you're wrong and I treat you a certain way because I disagree with you. Well, that's judgmental. We shouldn't be trying, listen, we shouldn't be trying to get to the conclusions with people all the time. We should be investing in the relationships, inviting and praying and sharing their faith, but they've got to come to that conclusion. Do you understand? The atheist uh, Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller once wrote this. This is amazing. She asked, she was once asked, how do, you, how do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting, everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? She goes on to say, I've, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. The famous atheist said, I don't respect that at all. If you believe there is a heaven and a hell and people would be going to hell for not gaining eternal life and you think that it's not really worth telling them that this because it would make you societally awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? Man, that, that's from an atheist, someone who claims they don't believe in God. Look, we know hell. Separation from God exists because Jesus tells us that it exists. For example, Jesus has more to say about hell than he does about heaven. He uses the term Gehenna, which is translated as hell, a dozen times in the Gospels and uses synonyms involving fire about 20 times. He also describes it in vivid detail, saying it is a place of torment. You know, we have... People in culture like little Nas who would have you believe that hell is a comfortable, good, happy place. 
But in Mark 9, 43, the scriptures say that hell is like an unquenchable fire and outer darkness in Matthew 25, 30. Eternal torment in Luke 16, 23. He says it's where the worm does not die, Mark 9, 48 where people will gnash their teeth in anguish and regret, Matthew 13, 42. A place of which there is no return, even to warm loved ones, Luke 16, 19 through 31. I'm not trying to scare you, and, but I just, more than anything else, it, Jesus talked about the doctrine of hell because he wants us to take it seriously. And it's not... Listen, hell is not an effective evangelism strategy. I wouldn't say lead with that, but it should be a compelling strategy for believers. Yeah, that should be in your heart and in your mind. So I wanna give you a couple practical takeaways, okay? A couple practical takeaways. Here's the first one. If you love God, you're going to pursue his, his deepest desire, which is for heaven to be full of people. Do you hear me? If you love God, you're gonna obey my commands. You're going to pursue his deepest desire, which is for heaven to be full of people. And so Jesus gave us the responsibility to go fill heaven. You know the story where they wanna have a feast and all the important people didn't come. So he said, go on the highways and the byways. Go find the people. Go bring them into the, my house and feed them. What are they feeding them? Eternal life. Hope. Winning. Second thing is, if you love people, then you don't want to see them separated from God. So if you love God, you're going to go to the highways and byways of your community, of your neighborhood, of your relationships, you're gonna bring them in. If you love people, you don't wanna see them separated from God. That, that's a measure of your love for people. Please hear me. A measure of your love for people is, am I compelled? Do, am, I, am I making a disciple? Am I evangelizing? Like, like don't claim that you love people. If you are satisfied with people being separated from God, now you can't control it, but you can be urgent. Third one is if you want to make disciples, you need to take some practical steps. I want to tell you a great story. And I don't have much left to preach today. But Jenna Foley, who's been with us since the beginning, she got into a bicycling at the beginning of the pandemic. She needed an outlet. And uh, she started connecting with a local cycling club. Funny enough, the founder of the cycling club, her mom, goes to the Northeast. Um, but she started to learn and she started to make friends. And God really gave Jenna a heart for her team, which is comprised of almost 70% Muslim. Prior to this, Jenna had been asking God, how do I reach my community? And this kind of fell into her lap. She started to get intentional. She started to build friendships. She started traveling and competing together. And then the, during the 40 days of prayer and fasting, she wrote 10 to 15 names on a board and started praying every single day. She's praying, God, let them get plugged into a local church. Let them meet you. Whatever influence or love you want to give, use me. Somebody needs to pray that right now. Whatever influence or love that you have from heaven, break my heart for what breaks yours and use me, God. She would invite them to church all the time, constantly and regularly being rejected by 30 people. Constantly. But she didn't give up because she loved them. And finally, some even started to attend, give their life to Christ, serve on teams and serve Saturday. Come on, give God a praise. She didn't give up. So you want to make disciples, you got to take some practical steps. You got to be bold. You have to be prayerful. You, you can't be confined just to inviting, although that's important. You got to invest in relationships. You've got to invite the church. You, you can't give up on people. Don't say no to God about certain people. 
You should join teams and, and join leagues and join opportunities to encounter those who need Christ. Get in your community. Don't only have relationships that are Christians only. We got to occupy our communities. You got to be practical about it. And at the end of the day, if you want to reach people who don't know Christ, you need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You do. If, if you want to reach people who don't know Christ, you need a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, you have the Holy Spirit when you come into Christ, but are you in a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Are you being filled daily? Are you having conversations? Holy Spirit, when I am at the restaurant, is there something you want to say to the waiter or the waitress? When I'm at school today, use me. Is there something you want to do? Give me a word of knowledge that will pierce through. Oh, I love this. I, I love this quote. I, I, I want to give it to you. It's, it's, it's by Leonard Ray. Ravenhill. And basically, he says this. He says, a man with an experience of God is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. And so, if you are full of the Holy Spirit, then you're going to have experiences with God, and you're going to bring forth experiences with God. And then those who have arguments about lofty ideas or ideologies or theories that don't have experiences connected to it, it's going to fall short because when they feel the power of God and the love of God and the hope of God and the peace of God, when they experience you praying for them and they're healed, when they experience you giving them a word, how did you know that about my life? And when they experience love with no conditions attached to it, all of a sudden the arguments begin to fade because they're having an experience with the Holy Spirit through you. All you have to do is seek and ask. Be filled daily. Ask him to use you. All you have to do is pay attention. Notice God opportunities at any moment. And as we close this time, I gotta ask you, is your heart broken for what breaks God's heart? I mean, really, I'm not saying you don't go about enjoying your life. I'm not, I'm not saying that you don't have fun with, with people, but like God's heart, it beats for souls. That's what his heart beats for. Those who don't know him, what does your heart beat for? And you can't be a disciple if you don't go make disciples. And we make disciples by bringing them to Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit today in Jesus' name. Amen. You receive this word. If you do, say yes and amen. Come on, let's give God a praise every location. Let's stand to our feet at every location. Nobody moving. If you're online, participate with me. But there are people actually here today. You are lost. You've heard this message and you're like, I actually, I, I'm, somebody brought me today or... I'm listening because I don't have a relationship with God. Whatever your situation is today, he's here and you are home. And so I want you right now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, even online, you're listening to my voice. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe at one point you did, but you don't anymore, or you've never had a relationship with God, today is the day. Don't harden your heart. Now is the time. This is the moment. If that's you and you hear my voice and you want to get right with God, you want to begin a journey with God, you want to start your journey again, if that's you, would you lift your hand right now? Right now, at every location, online, give me that hand emoji. Show me you're with me. God wants to touch you. He wants to hug you. He wants to bring you home. You're far from God. Need to get right with God. Begin a journey with God. Wave it at me right now. If you've lifted your hand, prayer people in, in, at locations are coming to you. But I want us to say this prayer, every person to encourage those who prayed loud and proud. Can we say, Jesus, Jesus. Thank, you thank you for the cross. Thank you for loving me, you for, loving for saving me, from rescuing, rescuing me. I receive you today. Receive you today. Forgive, me of my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Be the leader of my life. Raise me to new life like you were raised. I give you everything today. I'm yours and I trust you're mine. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Listen to me. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you are saved. Heaven is your destiny. Your best days are in front of you, and it may not get easier, but it will get better. Come on, let's give it up for all those today.